on this beautiful Sunday night, we are coming to you live from our Nile Serena studios. This is Perspective with Josephine Karunji. A very good evening and thank you for joining us. Welcome to the program. Tonight we'll be talking about uh, the man. Last week we were talking about feminism and we thought it was only fair that we should hear from a man about his perspective on where today's man is in society. So let's set, set the stage and take a look at a clip that we collected earlier this week on what men think is the definition of a man. I think that a man needs to be responsible and accountable. If you find a man that um, makes responsible decisions and is willing to be accountable for them, I think that that is a good man. A man needs to be responsible for many things. He needs to be responsible for his family. He needs to be accountable to his family. He needs to be responsible for his money. He needs to be accountable for his money. He needs to be responsible for his sexuality and also accountable for it. So when you find a man who is willing to be responsible and accountable, I think you have found a good man. I, I would give it, you know, like in a comparison format. Because back in the day, about, you know, a decade ago, a man was defined by, you know, protection and he was expected to become a provider. But with the changing society now and the whole issue of gender equality, that whole definition has changed. It no longer stands to define a man. So a man nowadays, you know, is just an ordinary human being to me because what a man can do, even, even the other fellow human beings can do. I also think that the roles in society have changed. Men are a bit, the women and the men, we, we, are, we are equal. In a way, we are equal. I can understand that the man has got to be seen as a leader in, in many aspects. And when I speak of a leader, I mean possibly at home. Um, in our workstations and uh, church and everything, Maybe we are equal. Maybe we can hold all, all the same roles. There are as many definitions of what a man is supposed to be as there are men on this planet. However, I tend to fall more towards the more traditional definitions of a man. And that is, a man is somebody who takes care of, provides for, and protects those over whom he has a responsibility. Now, while this might mostly be family, I think it also goes beyond that to mean responsibility and uh, providing for people other than family, like the community and, uh, you know, the neighborhood and any other, any, other, any other people for whom he has a responsibility over. Well, those were the different perspectives on who a man is from the different people that we were able to speak to. As you can see, they're as diverse as they can be. Well, joining me in the studio for our conversation tonight is Joseph Cabaleto, who is the author of Strength of Character. Welcome, Joseph. Thank you. Well, let's get straight into our conversation and say it as it is. Oh, Joseph, um, I thought we'd be playing uh, another clip right there, but we missed that. So um, if you could describe yourself, because I know you, you from your book that you are a different man now from the man that you were, say, about 10 years ago or maybe five, how many? Well, um, perhaps five. About five years yeah. ago. So if you could describe the Joseph of five years ago, six years ago, in one word, what would you say? Um, impulsive, uh, spontaneous. That's more than one word, but um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure it can fit in one <laughs> I'm word. I'm not limiting you. <laughs> um, uh, unempathetic um, and things like that. But generally, um, what society defined for me, my experiences and all that, I just went there without thinking why I'm there. So I found my place in, myself in a place where my experiences, good or bad, and society and my interactions with people before had put me without asking myself, why am I there? Is that where I'm supposed to be? So that's how usually most people are. So when they say that, uh, from the answers we've had there, that you know, um, society has changed. Society is not supposed to change a man, what a man is supposed to do. Because um, 
somebody like me who believes God created a man, the purpose does not change through eternity. I mean, through from creation to now. Cultures change, but the role for which God created a man does not change. Does not change. So yeah. to go back to my question, so mm. you would say um, your definitions of yourself then? Mm. Um, uh, was um, cocky, um, um, arrogant, impulsive, uh, a bit impetuous, and, well, so many other such things. <laughs> and what of yourself, looking at yourself now? Well, now I'm so different because I think through everything I say, I think through everything I do, and I always think from the perspective of the other person. So that's called empathy because uh, when I'm about to do something, I look at how it is going to affect the person to whom I'm doing it before I actually take time to do it. So, so many times um, the impulse is to do something, but I, I just have that break now between the impulse and what comes out, and then I see, is this going to build the person? How, how are they going to react to this? Is there a fairer way, a better way, a, a more empathetic way of communicating my point? Can it be ignored and just live with, uh, li uh, live with it? At what point did you, did you begin to, to see or to feel or to understand that your character then, as cocky and impulsive and all those things, was harmful, maybe to yourself or even to the people around you? Um, uh, to both of us, uh, myself, my colleagues, uh, my family, everybody. Um, of course, usually it takes a crisis uh, for people to stand still and ask what's wrong with me. And in my case, the crisis was uh, the failure of a marriage, uh, which I wanted to keep but which I couldn't keep. And um, uh, like when you've been with somebody for five years and they wake up one day and uh, walk out of your house and they don't want to see you again, then you, um, there are two ways you could react to it. You could uh, blame the person and all that, or you could actually stand still and say, what is wrong with me? Because it wasn't just her, it was other people. Now, uh, there were people whom I would be with, uh, let's say in workplaces and uh, my colleagues who somehow kind of thought maybe I was good as what I, at what I, I used to do because um, I was a good writer, I was, you know, good, all that. And they would kind of, like, admire from a distance, but none of them were friends. And none of them would want to come close to you. So when you needed a friend, and you realize you actually had very few friends, people whom you could call friends, then you had to stop at some stage and ask, what is wrong with me? How come other people have no problem making and keeping friends, while for me I, um, I seem to have that problem. What is it that made somebody whom I stayed with for all these years want to walk out and into an unknown world and should rather be there than be with you? So that, is, that was the turning point for me and uh, it didn't come obviously by what happened. I still went on, carried on blaming, you know. Uh, it's always easier to blame the other party and the mind is built in a way where it has a defense mechanism. And um, that the first instinct is to defend yourself. Yes. And so when something happens that is wrong, always you start blaming the other person. And uh, all, almost always, when a man, it is, uh, they will blame the woman. And that has always been the case um, from the Garden of Eden, when God asked Adam, why did you eat the fruit? And he says, the woman that yes, you gave me. So it has always been that way, the woman that you gave me. So it is so natural for a man to blame them. But then you start asking yourself, it's not just her, it's other, you know, and you look through your life and at some stage you have to stop and say, is there something terribly wrong with me? And uh, that's when I started asking the questions that uh, led to the transformation. And I, I remember at, at a certain point in your book, you mm. said you asked a friend and the friend said, do you really want to know? Yeah, oh yeah, uh, it was, uh, it was it, because I was, I, I was going through a moment of introspection. So there's this person I used to work with and uh, she knew me. And so one day I casually asked, now I was beginning to ask myself, what kind of person am I? So I asked her one day, what kind of person am I? And then she looked at me and uh, tried to ignore her question. Then I asked her again, what kind of person am I? Then she said, well, do you really want to know? I said, yes, I would want to know. Then she asked me the second time, do you really want to know? I said, yeah, I'd want to know. Now I wasn't so sure I wanted to know <laughs> when she asked the second time because I wasn't sure I was ready for brutal what honesty. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, after she asked me the third time, and I was now less confident in answering that I would want to know, she um, kind of diverted and ended up telling me about a joke, some, some joke she had read off the internet. Oh. So the fact that she actually chose not to answer said, a lot. said everything I needed to know about myself. Oh, 
from your story, do you, when you look around mm. the community now, mm. do you think this is a problem character? That's a big problem that cuts across? Oh, it is. It is a very, very, very big problem. And the thing is, so many people do not know what is wrong. I know I didn't. Uh, I could just see symptoms, and it's more or less like a sickness. You see symptoms, but you cannot get your finger to what the real problem is. So you keep on trying to work around the symptoms. For instance, I knew I had a, a temper. I would get angry so fast. Now, I would try to tell myself I'm not going to get angry. And 30 minutes down the road, I am right <laughs> back there. And then I swear this is the last time I'm not going to get angry. 30 minutes later, I am right back there. Now, it's, it's pointless. It's more or less like somebody who has flu saying I'm not going to sneeze. You are going to sneeze. Unless you deal with the flu, you will sneeze. So now, if you don't know what the sickness is and you're trying to deal with the symptom, they just keep on recurring and recurring and recurring, and uh, no amount of willpower can okay. help you not to sneeze if you have flu, okay? However, if you get to treat the flu and it goes, then the other becomes easy. Oh, you're a Christian man. Yes, um, I am. Mm. So we know you also as the watchman and mm. many other things. Mm. But then there's the tendency for people to think that because you're a Christian, your character should be the, the, you know, should, you should be the perfect man, that, that then when a Christian man falls short, so now it feels like all the Christian men are the ones with the worst character. No, it's not that they are the ones with the worst character, it is that the Christianity does not affect the character, I mean, does not necessarily mean that somebody has a character, or even any other faith. Um, uh, I've seen some of uh, the most pious and religious people with the most terrible characters, and I mean, uh, despicable characters. Then on the other hand, you see people who are not pious, at, you know, who are perhaps uh, something different, and they have better characters. So this has nothing to do with religion. So where does or, it come from? The, where does it come from? Um, for the most part, it is defined by, unless of course you get to the root of it and root it out, but it is defined by your experiences in life. In the book I mentioned about um, uh, going to boarding school early and how that affects you and how that makes you lack empathy because uh, I mean, quite honestly, at a time when you, you, you should be looking to your parents to... You are six years old. Yes, to pamper you. And um, there is no such... You know, you're one of so many kids in a school and nobody... So there is something that breaks at that stage because you learn how to fend for yourself. You learn, you know, survival for the fittest and what at ages when you should actually just be sit down and say, I'm hungry and somebody brings food, ideally. Now, uh, you may think those are good things and actually perhaps they help you to be a bit of, um, you know, street smart, but they affect your character, they affect your empathy, they affect the way you relate with people, and most importantly, they affect your emotional development. Because the reason, what is at the heart of all defective character is the development of emotions. Now, you fa have found people who are in their mid-twenties, and they have emotions of a six-year-old. For example? Uh, well, uh, there, are, there are many. I give actually some in, um, in the book. Uh, one of them is uh, Mike Tyson. Oh, uh, yes. And I mentioned how at the age of, uh, he was in his late 30s, and he lost his daughter uh, who was on a treadmill accident. She fell down on, you know, exercise treadmill, and, she, uh, and a few days later he was walking. He was well, getting married. He was getting married. Now, you say what kind of man, and actually he described that, the loss of his daughter, as the worst thing that ever happened to him. He actually said prison, because he had been to prison. He said prison is like Sunday school in comparison. But a few days later, he's getting married. Now, why? Because even if he is a mature man, physically and intellectually, emotionally, I mean, children are not expected to mourn for too long. <laughs> uh, so emotionally, his emotions are at that level. So he can actually get over it that fast. Mm -hmm. So he lacks the... Um, that emotion to actually, now there is nobody who is emotional, even, okay, even, if they are, I've seen emotions which are preteen, teen, um, uh, okay, I've also seen those which are adult, adult. but all <laughs> these in adult people, <laughs> so I've seen adult people with emotions of an eight-year-old, okay. and they will respond accordingly. Okay, mm. well, um, let's continue, but let's first take a short break, and then we'll pick up from there when we return. Welcome back. We're coming to you live from the Kampala Serena Conference Center, Nile Room. Well, Joseph, Rita had a question for you. Rita, if you could uh, quickly ask Joseph your question so that we can move on to the next topic. Yes, Rita, go ahead. Can I? Yes. Just go ahead with your question. Okay, my name is Rita. My question is, 
many people describe character according to the tribe or religion or anything. So I would like to know, is character inherited or it's a person who determines the character to go with? All right, thank you. No, it, it's most definitely not inherited because you would know if you have siblings, they and you have different characters, yet you actually belong to the same parents. Uh, in, for the most part, even both parents, you definitely same ethnicity, same race, same uh, everything. So it has not, it's not inherited. Um, different people, even brothers and sisters, uh, come out with totally different characters. So the answer is no. It can be something you want it to be. If you do not want what you see, you can change it. That is the whole point in what I'm trying to say here today. All right. Mm. Well, Joseph, you mentioned earlier that uh, the turning point, one of the things that caused you to look at yourself was the loss of, of your marriage. Mm. What could you have done years ago, five or so years ago, that could have saved it? Do you think there's anything that you could have done differently? Yeah, uh, absolutely, yes. Um, and that's precisely what I'm trying to bring forth here, is that uh, you, because I felt helpless because I didn't know what to do. Now, they are, if, they, if I knew the things I know right now, back then I'm definitely sure it would have ended differently. Because I've spoken to some people after I got to know these things who found themselves in the position I found myself when uh, my marriage was on the rocks and I have actually seen them work with the knowledge that I give them to turn it around by changing who they are and their character. And so I've, uh, so I've seen the testimonials of people who actually got to know certain things. Ali and saved theirs. And Ali and saved theirs. So what could you have done different? Um, uh, well, just been a different character, but more specifically, I could have watched my tongue and the things that I said. I learned that, um, um, well, this is, this is not an official statement, but I learned that for the most part, women will forgive you for what you did, but never for what you say. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I, and I know how important words are to women, so I would have watched my words. Now the thing is, I was very careless with my words. And I was capable of bringing out words which were very, very, well, not good. And that's the married way of putting it. But now I tend to watch everything I say. So I would have watched my tongue. I would have uh, been a lot more empathetic. I didn't have the ability to. The person that I was could not be that. And um, because uh, I was insecure, I was always, always looking out for myself. And I could have listened to her a lot more than I did. And um, if just by listening. Actually, just by listening, I could have changed so many things. But the thing is, uh, when she would say something, I trivialize it, because in my world, it's not important. And um, uh, then you find out later that it's so important because it could have saved your marriage. So sometimes listening is uh, the biggest way in, for the sake of marriages. But ultimately, I would have just been a different person. Let's say the person that I am now. Well, for most people, um, when you speak about the loss of a marriage, the thought is either he was cheating or he was violent or something like that. But in your book, you say that was not the case with you. So what was so bad that you couldn't be forgiven? Well, um, uh, I, I know that, you see, okay, I, I've met all sorts of people since I started doing this study. Uh, I'll tell you that I met a lady who was praying that her husband would be unfaithful once so that she can leave him and so the issue is if he had been unfaithful she would go and tell people the reason i left is because he's unfaithful but it's not the reason it is the excuse now until you get to the reason now so many people have excuses because what are you going to tell your peers you would rather you tell them he's violent he beat me up then they will say okay that's, that's acceptable uh, or let's say he cheated that's acceptable but then there are people who are in such places and they actually are not moving Perhaps because they said so. So if, until I met this person who said, I am so bored of this marriage, I'm so tired of this man, I wish he would do something bad so that I have a reason to leave. Then I say, oh, excuse me, so all the time, so if he would cheat, she would be happy because she has the reason to leave, the excuse. But at the heart of it is a real reason which very few people ever get to the bottom of. What was it that he did that made the fact that he's not violent, he's not cheating, mean nothing? she still wants out in spite of those apparent good qualities. So he might be a provider, might be a He might be a provider, might he might be, be even a good Christian, he might be um, uh, non-violent, he might even, all these other things which on top look good, but still a woman is unfulfilled because, uh, and, and the, if she's unfulfilled, then she's, something is going to break at some stage. Now the things, because women were never trained to understand what it is that makes a woman fulfilled in a relationship, so until we get to the crust of that, and what is it that, 
that thing which is almost undefined. And you see, when we fail to get it, we say women are complicated. But actually, it's, def it, it's, not, it's, not, non it's, it's not nondescript. It can be figured out and gotten and um, fulfilled. And then all these other good qualities, if they are there, um, only complement the other one. Now, if a man does all these good things, which can be ticked in a bulletin, provider, yes. Faithful, yes. Uh, what? Yes, yes, yes. But I still want out. What is the problem? What is the problem? So what was the problem for you? No, the thing is, um, that person, uh, I will not talk this time about myself, but that person whom I met who was praying, that husband cheats, um, the issue was that he was, um, uh, well, he, she, he was distant. She never felt emotionally connected to him. He was around, but he was never around. So at no one time did, they, did she feel that she's a part of his life. Now, these are the things which uh, men get from all sorts of places, where somebody is with you, but she's, uh, I mean, uh, emotionally, she's at a distance. Now, the woman's biggest fear, I learned, is that she will not connect emotionally with her husband. Now, when that emotional connection is hit, so many other things can be forgiven just because of that. Now, when that emotional connection is not hit, everything else is compounded and becomes so big. So now, of course, these are mysteries for men, and uh, I mean, absolute mysteries, it's like talking about, you know, the galaxies and so on. But the reality is, um, previously, men would survive in marriages with all these weaknesses, because women were taught, you know, just, uh, be, yeah, guma, guma, and, and, and that be was, there. That was going to be my next okay, question. I was going to ask you, <laughs> but why do you think that now it's harder for women to just stay and just stay with the status quo as it was for maybe our parents back then? Yeah, because our parents were taught um, to just, uh, you know, endure. So um, uh, perhaps our parents or grandparents, so, you know, were taught marriage is about endurance, the man is always right, and so on and so forth. So uh, the woman is supposed to endure, and all her needs are not met. And um, so she somehow buries her life into looking after children, and then she's back to her emptiness when the children grow up and leave the house. That was then, and it could have survived um, in the past generation. But now women are a lot more, you know, um, you know they, are, they are a lot more exposed. So they are going to be in a marriage because they are fulfilled. And until the men actually learn how to fulfill the women, then they will not hold on to them on the basis of previous cultural, you know, um, uh, generalities of just stay there, just get married, stay there, we don't want to see you again, don't ever come to your parents' home, endure whatever is done to you. No, that does not cut these days. So now, from, and, and yet actually men want to stay in their marriages. For, for, so for it to happen, we actually have to get to the root of what it is to be a man. What does a woman look for in a man? Why does a woman feel that she needs a man in her life to be complete? And now when we get that, then we are able to keep our marriages, Together. not through uh, endure, 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 but through somebody being happy. Okay. Mm. Well, you also say in your book that insecurity rules out the man in the mirror as the problem. Mm. So when you look in the mirror, you're not the problem. Mm. Everybody else mm. around you is the problem. Mm. And I wanted to know, what is the leading cause of insecurity in men? Well, uh, for the mo insecurity is caused by so many things, but for the most part it is caused in childhood, uh, uh, upbringing, absentee fathers, uh, fathers who do not, you know, um, you know, really are in their life, the lives of their children and all that. So somehow, a lot of the things children are supposed to learn at a later age, they are forced to learn earlier. So now there is, then their emotional growth is interrupted. Now, I will tell you what emo briefly what emotional growth is. When a child is growing, they grow physically, intellectually, and they are supposed to grow emotionally. Now, physically, of course, we know what they need, and intellectually, but emotionally, they need a stable home. Uh, ideally, a two-parent home where they are, you know, nurtured and all that. And that emotional growth goes all the way up to 21. Now, when a child has the benefit of that, they turn out to be empathetic, good husbands, good leaders, stable men, who a woman can trust and uh, give herself to, and trust that he will lead her. But of course, that's not usually how our families pan out for all sorts of reasons. So, so then men are churned out there who are, you know, half-baked, so to speak. But the good news is that you can actually bake yourself to full emotional growth by just knowing this, the information that I'm bringing right now, and you get yourself there, and you'll be the kind of man that can be trusted by a woman. Well, how do you deal with the insecurity? 
um, insecurity is defined as my definition, okay, definition. as um, I, you know, a crisis of identity. And um, there, there are four things, I'll say this, that our soul needs to grow, that a person needs to grow. Uh, identity is one of them, purpose is the other. Um, well, those are the two main ones, uh, identity and purpose. And so everybody, even if you had everything, if you, don't, if you didn't know who you are and what your purpose is, you're kind of all over the place. I'll give you an example. If your mother told you that the man you believed was your father, is not your father, your father is somebody else. Uh, you thought you were Muganda, now you suddenly find out that you're from West Nile. Now, it doesn't change your income. It doesn't change who you are. It doesn't change anything, you're right? But it, it will throw you off your guard because the core thing of who you are, your identity, has been tampered with. You understand? Now, you find even people like that going and becoming drunkards and what because you always believed yourself to be this. So now it has been taken away. Now, insecurity is a crisis of identity, and it makes people want to be, you know, wanna be Zim, uh, putting up appearances, impressionism, and all those things. All those are signs of insecurity, but they're just the outward signs. They are inner ones. For instance, insecure people are always trying to protect themselves, protect um, how people perceive them, how people, you know, it's more about the show than what it really is. So you find somebody who is going to walk in public with his wife and create an impression. Everything is all right. Everything is okay. Yet, and, I mean, as soon as they enter the car, everybody looks the other window. <laughs> and, um, and that's, no, 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 the thing is, uh, the, marriages can be like it, but the point is, why is it so important to you what people think than what actually is? Now, if you have ever get yourself into a position where the perception is more important than the reality, then you're insecure. That is the definition. Okay. Um, well, Joseph, let's take another short break and we'll, we'll continue on insecurity when we return. Okay. Welcome back. We're coming to you live from the Kampala Serena Conference Center, Nile Room, and we're talking insecurity with Joseph Kabaleta, who is the author of Strength of Character. Well, Joseph, I, I wanted to find out from you. So, a man is insecure. What road does insecurity take him on? Well, um, first of all, it, because nobody, when you're insecure, you, the only thing that matters to yourself is yourself. So you, 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 have, you have no ability to be empathetic, to think about other people, and um, generally to take on the role of being any sort of leader um, in any way. So what, what it does, and this even affects workplaces, and you know, everyone has had an, an incident with an insecure boss, who will um, not permit people to thrive under him because he feels everything that is positive coming from and uh, somebody who's working under him, a subordinate, is a threat to him. And you've seen people like that who are threatened by any sort of success around them. Uh, all that is insecurity and makes them terrible leaders uh, in any place. So it's not just, this is not just about marriage or anything. I've seen, um, you know, uh, I'll give you an example, coaches who are insecure. And when one of his players is praised in the media, and I've seen them even here as a sports journalist in Uganda, and the coach will come and say, you media are spoiling our players. What he's trying to say is, why do you put him, not me, in the papers? <laughs> and um, that, that's insecurity. And, and now you see what actually makes good people good leaders is, let's say, the good managers that you know in the world, is that they are not going to start fighting with players for media limelight. They're above that. They, so if your player is praised, Indirectly, you're being praised, and they know that. So you're not going to find, let's say, um, um, okay, I'll give you an example, Asen Venga fighting because they are praising Thierry Henry or something like that. No, it's okay. They praise him. He's good. Uh, but when you praise him, you praise me because I bought him. I'm putting him in the team. But you see now, um, so you, you, all relationships in workplace and what are spoiled when people do not know how to apportion credit to those who, to whom it is deserving. Uh, one man put it this way, he said that great things happen when nobody cares who takes the credit. Uh, conversely, so many things are spoiled because people are fighting for credit when even the work at hand has not been done. And then suddenly everything ta goes haywire and what was supposed to be good becomes ugly and uh, all because they are insecure people fighting for credit. Now then there will be one secure person who will sit back and say, you take the credit, I have no problem. Guess what happens? Eventually the credit comes back to him and without him seeking it, or courting it, or fighting for it. So all these things are problems which um, blight our society. Well, w when you spoke about um, the lack of empathy, you mm. took me to toxic masculinity, and mm. that's something that I wanted to, you to mm. speak about. Mm. And one of the definitions we got was socially constructed attitudes that describe the masculine gender role as violent, unemotional, you know, having no empathy, 
Well, um, that's toxic. <laughs> that's really toxic. And as you said, to toxic masculinity. But it is picked out of the culture, the old culture, the patriarchal culture of, you know, the man is the man and, you know, uh, somehow everything he does is right. Now, that passed for those times, but and was... Uh, Has the, it, oh, okay, it passed then? It, it was passed okay. then. It, was, it could have passed at that time because somehow things hadn't changed as they are now. Now, everything is different. There are very few people who will settle for that, um, especially um, people who have seen the world, I mean, and so many ladies have, and they're not going to settle for that toxic thing. They are in a relationship for a purpose and to get something fulfilled, and they need a man who has the qualities that they want in a man. And being empathetic, emotional, and, you know, insecurity does not uh, make somebody unromantic. There's nobody who is secure who is romantic. Because, um, I mean, oh, sorry, there's, who nobody is who is, there's nobody who is insecure who is romantic. Because, you know, when you tell somebody whom you love that I love you and it comes from your heart, what you're actually saying is I need you. And what you're saying is that my life would not be the same without you. Now, an insecure person will never bring themselves to that. They have this thing of seguya, you know, if you don't want you go, that sort of thing. Eh? Now, that is insecurity. Plus, plus, plus. Because everybody, <laughs> that, that, that attitude of uh, if you don't want, you go, you know, I can do without you, and you, you take on that. Man. Now, there's, it, now, the truth is, you, can, you actually would be hurt if that person left. But you would not even bring yourself to admit that you are hurt because you, 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 you think that takes away from your masculinity. Yet, in reality, it actually adds to it. Telling somebody that I need you and what they see the man in you rather than the other way around. I'll tell you this, uh, I was here on one of the shows on NTV earlier, um, some time ago, a Uganda show, and um, I spoke about some of these things, and a gentleman called me, and uh, we spoke, okay, and he told me that two women have walked out on him, and he has a good home, he has, you know, he has a house, he has all these things, and he's asking for answers. He said, what's wrong with me? Now, you see, do you, I mean, you, you think, it's easy, but when one woman walks, then the other one walks, and the third one is on the verge of walking, then, <laughs> then you know there's something wrong. Now, and it's not that you don't have money, because you do. It's not that there's anything wrong with you, because there is nothing. Then you actually have to get to the... Now, these are the answers that I'm, trying, I'm seeking to put across. Because now this person, because they want... At least they have noticed that there's something wrong. And he's not the only person, there are others, so many others. There's one who called me and had read you know, uh, my book and told me, thank you very much. I got married three months ago, and I was going down the same road, blaming the woman for everything, everything, until I read the book. Now I suddenly realize that um, actually uh, that I'm supposed to be the leader. And for the most part, when a man is a leader, the woman will follow. And the, uh, you know, we've been taught it, you know, the woman has to keep the relationship together. But the truth is, the man is at the you know, heart of it and is the leader. And women will want to follow somebody who shows themselves to be a leader. Even men, like at workplaces, anybody shows himself to be a leader, you will find people following you. Now, if you're all over the place, you can't stand up to a decision uh, which you made. You cannot uh, you know, be, uh, understand people's plights and all that. And you do not have any form of thinking from the other person's perspective. That is insecurity. Because you only think about yourself. Now, if somebody comes to you and you have the ability to put yourself aside, and think from their perspective. Now, this man is annoying me, he's doing this, but, or this person, but if I tell them what I think, how is that going to affect them? Now, if you can get yourself to that, then maybe you're on the road pathway to, you know, coming out of insecurity. But I will tell you this, from my experience, 90% of men in this city are insecure. The question, <laughs> the question is, uh, the question is to what degree? To what degree? But uh, some of them are as bad as I was, um, Others are not that bad, but I'll tell you 90% of them are. Well, since 90% of them are, is there a cure, or are we going to have 90% stuck <laughs> in that place? Is there a cure for No, there is a cure. There is a cure. And you have to realize that when you see something, I'll put it this way because I'm, um, I'm, I'm a, you know, a Christian and a believer. The Bible says, cling to what is good, okay, and abar what is evil. Now, when you see what is good, and you, when you see somebody manifesting himself in the way you'd want to be, where he's... You know, he attracts friends, uh, he has a happy, you know, <laughs> wife. <laughs> now, there's, uh, there's a reason actually why previously you're not even allowed to be president. You could not be elected president, let's say, of America, unless you are 
of course things have changed now eh? unless you've been the husband of one wife and the people know that you have you know one woman in your life because somehow <laughs> you know having a woman who is content in your life shows that you are a, a total man eh? and not just impulsive because if you're jumping from one to the other to the other to the other then something is wrong and it's most likely not wrong with them it is with you so previously in years back that was a prerequisite for you to be put in any form of leadership uh, having one woman whom you've been with all the time. Then people say, now that is a man. Now, um, of course I wouldn't qualify because of that, but the thing is, um, <laughs> I just had to get that out of yes, the way. Yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but when this man stands up and realizes there's something wrong with me, that is the beginning. Like uh, that gentleman whom I spoke to. That, that, that is so powerful, very powerful. So you say, what is wrong? So he came, we stopped for more than two hours in my office and I were discussing some of these things. Now, when you start seeking for answers and when you um, start seeing that there's somebody there who, how come he has a happy, you know, wife? How come he has, you know, a happy family? How come he leads and everybody is happy? When he's put in a position of leadership, everybody is comfortable. How come when there is a position of leadership, whatever, everybody suggests him naturally, even when he's not interested. And you've seen people like that. When they say, we are lead I mean, I uh, want a class monitor, he's, he's the first he's person, the first to person. Be nominated. Then when they want, it goes all the way into adulthood when they say, we want somebody to lead this, everybody will suggest him, even when he's not interested. Why? Because they see a leader in him. Now, if you see such a kind of person, don't think he's different. You can get what he has. Now, that's the, the purpose of me coming and saying all these things. You can study what he has, and get it and be exactly the same. Now I'll tell you that the way people responded to me previously is different from now. Now I'm sure if they wanted a leader, they would nominate me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> now, Are you campaigning? I, I'm not campaigning for any position. Just, my, because our time mm. is, is fast spent, my mm. final question to you, and mm. as you wrap up, mm. uh, we just have about two minutes. Mm. What role does socialization play? What role does it have to play with the way men today have turned out? Socialization. Because society seems to have claims on. Yes, and because, um, uh, since we, in two, two, two minutes, I'll give yes. you the answer. Here's the answer. So there is this person who comes to me so many years later with his wife, and the wife is very disgruntled because he provides for her, gives her money, and all that, but there is no connection. They, they don't have any time together, and she wants that. Now, when I speak to him, I realize that there is something which was crystallized in his days at university. When he was in third year, he was uh, in love with a girl in second year, and he really, really loved her, and she was the answer to all these problems and all that. And then somebody older came who had more money than him and took her away from him. So now he doesn't know, but in his mind, it was formulated that so women want money. And now he doesn't, you don't get to those conclusions deductively. They come subconsciously because of your experience. So he says, oh, okay, so women want money. Now, 10 years later, he has a good job, he has money, so he just gets, a woman and gives her money and says that's what you people want. Now he doesn't know how we got there. Now everybody has to study what do I believe? What is, I mean, what are my perceptions on all these things? Where did I get them? What experience in my life could have gotten me to think these things? Now when you do that, then you actually start reversing and saying, okay, they might have taken my girlfriend in university, but not all women are like my girlfriend, my ex-former girlfriend. They might have, this might have happened to me, but not all bosses, are, you know, and all those things. Somebody might have abused me or molested me and what, but not all men are like that. So then that prepares you to um, receive, to get rid of all the garbage at the back and actually open yourself up to something good because God always has something good for everybody. All right. Mm. Well, your final words and just mm. two sentences. What would you like us to go away with from this conversation? What I'd like everybody to go away with is if your character is not what you want it to be, you can change it and it's not so difficult. If you are uh, an emotional retard, that means um, <laughs> your emotional development is, uh, is, stunted. is stunted or is not, does not, is not you know, um, uh, at the age of your physical and intellectual development, you can still change that. And it's not that difficult. You just have to understand what it is that is the problem and say, I can be like the other guy who everybody likes, who everybody considers for leadership, who are, and within a period of not just a few months of actually studying it, you will be that person and you will be the leader. And when you finish this, uh, the transformation, you will see how people will nominate you for leadership without even you wanting. You will have to turn down positions. 
All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Joseph. Thank you. That was Joseph Cavaletta, who is the author of Strength of Character. And that was our show tonight. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, Sheila Nkucha is coming up with NTV Weekend Edition. Keep it NTV. Renew your monthly basic bouquet subscription of 18,000 shillings before it expires. Then enjoy three free days only on Star Times. Enjoy.